Well, hello and good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us for Elevating Entrepreneurship and Small Business, How to Enhance Access to Capital and Training in the Marketplace. My name is Rhett Buttle. I am so thrilled to be able to be the co-executive director of the Small Business Roundtable. Today, we have an amazing agenda of speakers. We're going to hear from small business advocates, small business owners, and several members of Congress for what couldn't be a more important conversation right now. As we know, too many small businesses have suffered devastating blows from COVID-19. But as we work to build our country back, small businesses are the heartbeats of our communities and our economies, and they're going to create new jobs to help us build back better from COVID-19. We're so, uh, so grateful to have so many amazing representatives. We're going to hear from Representative Muser. We're going to hear from Representative uh, Judy Chu. We're also going to hear from a distinguished set of panelists from many of our amazing partner organizations like the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the Association for Enterprise Opportunity, um, and also uh, National ACE. With that, we have a big agenda to get to. We have a panel discussion. Uh, it is my pleasure now to turn the conversation over to uh, a leading advocate for small business, someone who serves on the House Small Business Committee. With that, Representative Muser, I'll kick it over to you for opening comments. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Well, it's great. Hey, Rhett, uh, thank you very, very much. And uh, certainly a pleasure being all uh, with all of you. A uh, very important subject, of course. And I was, I was very happy to be put on the uh, the Small Business Committee uh, with uh, Blaine Lukemeyer as our as our ranking member, uh, as well as our, our our chairwoman, who really does a, a terrific job. We do our best to be as as uh, bipartisan as as possible. Uh, my, my background was in small business. I helped grow a small business into a relatively large business. Uh, uh, well over a thousand employees over a course of uh, 25 years. Uh, but what was interesting about that was along with doing the work that was necessary to get there, all of our customers basically were uh, were small businesses uh, from mom and pops to uh, 2025 uh, to 100, 100 employees. Uh, so my, my life was spent largely working with them, not just providing them our products, but being very interested in, in their wherewithal, in their growth, in, in their, their, their livelihood. Uh, so being on the Small Business Committee and certainly being in, in, in Congress as a whole um, has, uh, has really been a, uh, small business has been very much of a point of focus for me even in the uh, last Congress when I was, was not on the Small Business Committee. My, my district, like most districts, 70% of the employment in the private sector uh, comes from small business. Actually, if you, uh, it's, even, it's even more than that. So um, we've uh, been working uh, to help small business uh, uh, grow, stay strong, have access to capital, of course, um, have access to, to, to the proper markets, you know, strong economy um, is uh, just so important to quality of life. And uh, then of course the pandemic hit and we all went into uh, battle stations, uh, literally. Uh, fortunately, we all got together on a bipartisan basis, came up with programs such as PPP, uh, the extended unemployment compensation and other, idle and, and, and such and, and other means to sustain and help small business and in, indirectly or directly uh, uh, workforce, the, uh, the employees, keep keeping people, keep businesses alive, um, sustaining themselves as well as uh, keeping their employees so as they didn't have to go on unemployment and, and uh, uh, lead to all the, the damage that would occur there. So we, um, uh, we worked very closely with the, with the SBA. Um, uh, heck, it was from seven o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock at night, myself and, and, and my staff for months with the PPP. Uh, fortunately, Treasury worked well with us and the local banks worked extremely well with us to assure that the PPP and other government subsidized and grants and all were, were made available. And that has continued. Uh, even though the PPP largely has now run its course and worked, you know, there were a few problems here and there, of course, but it worked out enormously well, the extended PPP, um, and, and then most recently, the, uh, uh, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, uh, which we're working on as well to use current internal funds 
to help provide additional funding there, because I'm sure you're well aware uh, the $30 billion that was allocated for the RRF is, uh, was quickly depleted. So the, the issue continues to remain the same um, for small business, although we're in recovery mode now um, uh, for restaurants as well. Uh, the warmer weather, particularly in Pennsylvania and other areas and uh, throughout the nation have certainly helped. Uh, but the lifeline, uh, which is access to capital, still creates that's our train here in uh, the beautiful Jim Thor, Pennsylvania, uh, coming through. Uh, met many small businesses right, right, out, right outside, of course. But you know the, the fundamentals, such as interest rates, uh, the concern of inflation, simply just continued access to to community banks uh, with with cash flows and uh, and just a lot of a, a, a lot of unsettling that took place, a lack of predictability. You know, some businesses are very low in inventory, some are very high. The supply chains were enormously disrupted. Uh, so we we continue to be in a very precarious place. Uh, so we we've got to play uh, pay uh, uh, very very close attention, and we got to be very careful from a government standpoint that we we help continue to create the most competitive business environment possible for small businesses, for all businesses, for, for families, so as the recovery uh, can really take place with as many uh, inhibitors that were, or as few inhibitors as possible, meaning regulations, taxes, and other requirements uh, that will, will diminish a small business's ability to, to advance. So um, uh, with that, there's certainly a lot more to talk about. I appreciate uh, very much this opportunity to speak on behalf of the uh, Small Business Committee. And uh, I uh, yield back yet, yeah, Rhett. Uh, Congressman Muser, thank you so much for your remarks. We really appreciate your leadership and your support to the small business community. That means a lot to us. Hello, my name is Chiling Tong, the president and CEO of the National Asian Pacific Islander American Chamber of Commerce and Entrepreneurship, also called National ACE. It is an honor for me to introduce our next speaker. Representing California's 27th Congressional District, Congresswoman Judy Chu was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in July 2009, where she became the first Chinese American woman elected to Congress in history. Since the beginning of pandemic, Asian community has been dealing with two illness. One is COVID, another is anti-AAPI hate. Congresswoman Chu has been fighting hard for the AAPI business community and also leading the fight against the rise in anti-AAPI hate since the beginning of this pandemic. And we are truly grateful for her persistence and determination during this challenging time. She knows how much the near daily tragedies of anti-Asian violence have shocked our nation. As a result of her un unwavering leadership, Congress passed the COVID-19 Hate Crime Act, which was signed into law by the president last week. Our community is just so overwhelmed by this news. And also Congresswoman Chu currently served on the House Ways and Means Committee and the House Small Business Committee, which has oversight of the Small Business Administration and is the chair of the Small Business Oversight Subcommittee. In 2011, Congresswoman Chu was elected chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, which advocates for the needs and the concerns of the AAPI community across the nation. She helped lead the Trade Caucus, a joint effort with the Congressional Black Caucus and Congressional Hispanic Caucus. She's also served in leadership of the House Democratic Caucus as a member of the Steering and Policy Committee. In her tenure, uh, Representative Chu has been dedicated to helping entrepreneurs by establishing two new small business development centers in the San Gabriel Valley and the helping small businesses refinance old, expensive real estate loans by reviving the Small Business Administration's 504 loan 
refinancing program. We are just so thankful for her, for her leadership. And it is my pleasure to give the floor to Congresswoman Judy Chu. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Chi Ling. Yes, I'm Congress member Judy Chu. And even though I have been a member of the House Ways and Means Committee for a few years, I feel so committed to small business that I've been on the House Small Business Committee for all 11 years that I've been in Congress. That is why I'm so happy to be with the Small Business Roundtable today for this important conversation on how we can ensure that small businesses have access to the capital they need to rebuild our economy. Small businesses are the backbone of our economy and are vital for our recovery. And that's why as a member of the Health Small Business Committee, I've been committed to helping firms like yours survive the pandemic and overcome the unprecedented burden that you have shouldered for our country. And that began last March when small businesses were the first to begin feeling the impacts of this crisis. As the coronavirus was just beginning to take hold, I sponsored legislation to extend the economic injury disaster loan to businesses who were seeing revenue losses as a result of the pandemic. But as we would soon realize, that was just the start. That is why Congress also created the Paycheck Protection Program or PPP, which was established through the CARES Act. This historic program has provided over $700 billion in forgivable loans to businesses and nonprofits. This funding helped businesses to stay open and keep their employees on the payroll, even when public health restrictions meant that they had to drastically reduce capacity or in some cases close their doors entirely. But there was a problem. Because of a lack of clear guidance when the program launched, too many of these loans went to the biggest businesses with existing relationships with traditional banks. That's why I fought for set aside lending authority for community financial institutions, which work with all businesses, but especially the most underserved and vulnerable ones. This set aside was a major success, but we still must ensure that PPP loans were distributed fairly and equitably to all communities. For example, there's been alarming reporting recently that found that the majority white neighborhoods in Los Angeles benefited from PPP far more than minority neighborhoods. We can't rebuild our economy unless every community is included. And so when I saw this disparity, I immediately sent a letter to the SBA administrator and Secretary of the Treasury asking for an analysis and plan to address racial disparities in the program. Our long-term recovery relies on distributing this assistance fairly to all small businesses, especially the underserved. Well, now PPP funding is nearly exhausted and we're moving to the next phase of recovery. That's why the American Rescue Plan which Congress passed in March was so important. It provided another infusion of cash for small businesses to make it through the end of the pandemic. And that includes the new restaurant revitalization fund, which will make up the difference in revenue between 2019 and 2020 for restaurants, bars, and other food and beverage businesses. It also creates a very important program, the new community navigators program to ensure that underserved communities are proactively connected to opportunities for business assistance. But now we have to also turn towards long-term recovery. And that means ensuring that every small business and entrepreneur has access to affordable capital to help them grow. As a member of the Small Business Committee, I know that means expanding and strengthening SBA's lending and investment programs. For instance, we must give more small businesses access to the government's core lending programs like 504, 7A, and microloans. And we also have to think of ways to get capital into the hands of small business owners who face the highest barriers so that they are included as well. That's why I've sponsored legislation to authorize the Community Advantage Loan Program at the Small Business Administration which specifically targets the businesses who are ready to grow, but have trouble accessing 
private fan financing and traditional 7A loans. And it's because the loans are originated by nonprofit mission-based lenders like community development, financial institutions, and certified development companies who provide hands-on technical assistance to their borrowers and have relationships in the underserved markets that need the most help. We know this model works because we just saw these same lenders answer the call and provide billions of dollars of PPP loans through the community financial institution set aside. I'm proud that my bill, which passed the House unanimously last December, would authorize this community advantage program for five years, allow SBA to make larger loans, increasing the target of underserved businesses, and specifically include businesses that are owned by people of color. I know that President Biden and Congress have the willpower to think creatively about ways to ensure our long-term recovery is a success, and this program will be a big part of that. And there's more good news. We've administered over 150 million vaccinations, with more being available every day thanks to the Biden administration and the resources that are pro provided through the American Rescue Plan. That means we are nearing the end of the crisis, and it means we have to start preparing to reopen and rebuild our economy. And that's why I was so thrilled to hear the president lay out his American Jobs Plan and American Families Plan. These are some of the most comprehensive and ambitious ideas yet to put more Americans to work and bolster our economy. And as a member of the committees that have jurisdiction over these issues, I'm so excited to get to work on this now. The American Jobs Plan includes billions in investments to ensure that small businesses are not left behind in the historic overhaul of our country's infrastructure. The plan will make starting a business easier by creating a nationwide network of small business incubators and innovation hubs, helping inventors, inventors commercialize their technologies, expanding the Small Business Administration's existing capital access and investment in programs like 7A, and ensuring that small firms are included in the federal contracting opportunities that will be a big part in our infrastructure investments. And by investing over $100 billion in nationwide broadband coverage, no small business will be forced to struggle just because they don't have access to high-speed affordable broadband. Most importantly, the new infrastructure investments in this bill are good for business. When we build a new train station, that means more people, more commerce, more new storefronts, and more jobs. When movement gets easier and people have more money in their pockets, small businesses succeed. I'm proud to be a fighter for small business. I know that means fighting for the families who make small business work. And as a member of the Ways and Means Committee, which has jurisdiction over paid leave policies, I've also been calling for a national paid leave law for years. I know this can work because it's been working here in California since 2004. And that is the goal of the American Jobs Plan. I'm so proud to work to make this goal a reality. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I look forward to continuing discussions on how to move the US forward. Well, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, on behalf of the whole team at Small Business Roundtable, we know what an incredible advocate we have in you and your office, all of those points you laid out, I think, are themes we're going to hear throughout the day. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with the Congresswoman for more than a decade on capital access solutions, so it is so nice to see you today, and thank you for those kind words. Um, we'll now transition into our panel part, but thank you again to our members of Congress taking time to participate in today's important conversation. We're so thrilled that uh, you, the attendees, can join us. Um, my name is John Stanford. I am the co-executive director of Small Business Roundtable, and I'll serve as moderator for today's panel. Let's jump right into it because we have three really impressive speakers. I'll give brief bios and then open the conversation so that we can spend as much time hearing from them as possible. I do encourage you to submit questions through the question and answer function, and we'll get to as many as we can. Today, on today's panel, we have Connie Evans, a longtime advocate of, for small businesses. She is the president and CEO of 
the Association for Enterprise Opportunity, or AEO, where she has built on an incredible career of advancing self-employment and micro-business policy. Her bio is pretty long to read, but she served two terms on the board of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. She was the first African-American woman to hold such a position. She's been on the CDFI advisory board and even a delegate to the United Nations for President Obama. Connie has been a longtime champion of the micro business community. We also are fortunate to hear from an entrepreneur. Today, uh, we are joined by Megan Benson, who is the owner of Sheep Farm Felt, uh, based in Southern New Jersey, which specializes in uh, wool decor items. Uh, she began that business um, in 2014 at her dining room table and has been using the fiber from her family sheep farm. She's grown that team in the US, but also in Nepal. It's a true success story. And her products are found on platforms like Amazon and Etsy. I think it's also fair to say this is one of our first entrepreneurs to get some serious celebrity influencer support. So we look forward to hearing Megan's story. Last and certainly not least is Ramiro Cavazos, the president and chief executive officer of the US Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. He was formerly the head of San Antonio's chamber for 10 years. He has been a champion for all things Hispanic business ownership. He's a seventh generation Texan and he wouldn't let me forget that if I did. Uh, but he's been a force in Washington for Hispanic and uh, Latino business owners. So we have an incredible panel today um, and we'll, we'll jump right in. And Connie, I thought I'd, I'd kick the first question over to you. Um, AEO is the voice of the micro business community and a leader on micro finance. Can you talk about some of that work you're doing and why it's so important to prioritize uh, underserved communities in this access to capital conversation? Certainly, John, and it's a pleasure to join you and my other panelists. And it was wonderful hearing the comments from uh, our two representatives who joined us. It is very important that we prioritize um, policies and programs, not only just for capital, but for capital and training and other resources for small businesses, particularly those that are underserved and underrepresented. They are battling issues such as trust issues, the characteristics of their businesses, you know, means that they are often very, very small. And if we think we are building programs and policies universally and that they're going to meet the needs of these business owners, we're really fooling ourselves. Not only must we prioritize um, these communities and the entrepreneurs within them, we must also design our programs and products and services to meet their special needs. So the, priori the prioritization is not only about um, uh, people of color and people who are underrepresented in, throughout our communities and in this marketplace overall, but we must design and have that intentionality to make sure that we are bringing products and services and policies to the marketplace that really will work for all. But we have to design and be very intentional because there are serious barriers such as trust, as I mentioned before, that really prevent them from accessing capital, even when we think we're making capital available. We listened, for example, to Representative Chu talk about how she has moved to make sure that CDFIs and community banks uh, are, are given priority, are part of the real mix of the market actors who can participate in bringing you know, inc more inclusiveness in, in the marketplace. But even in that case, we still have to make sure the right products are, are designed for these business owners if they're really going to be able to take advantage and be successful. Well, Connie, I think that's a real, I, I hope you'll talk more about the trust gap. I know AEO and you have been a leader in, in that conversation. And um, I think it's important. Capital doesn't sit in a silo. Uh, Ramiro, you know, you run the voice of Hispanic owned businesses in this country. Um, what are some of the work you're doing to tackle access to capital issues that you see in the, in the Latin X population? Thank you, John. It's an honor to be here with the Small Business Roundtable, our Congress people, and of course, Connie and Megan. Uh, our Hispanic chamber based in Washington, DC 
has been in business for more than 40 years and we represent 5 million Hispanic owned businesses uh, predating the pandemic. These businesses were struggling with access to capital already. Many of them are mom and pop businesses, many of them considered invisible, but doing the powerful work of our community. We have more than 250 Hispanic chambers of commerce in our national network, along with Puerto Rico in every state that are doing the work of the people, that each of them is an economic oasis in their communities. I qualify my response by saying it's in three C's. The first bucket is access to capital. Now, after the pandemic, that capital needs to be readily available in creative ways. Uh, we talked about 504 earlier and 7A programs. Now the restaurant fund, the PPP, we need to continue to have a sense of urgency about access to capital, cash flow, cash flow, cash flow is critical for all of our small businesses right now, regardless of their ethnic background. The second C is connections. They need contracts. Our businesses don't just need capital, they need business also. And we should remember that they are driving this economy. 70% of the US economy is driven by consumer spending. We're the new mainstream, Black, Asian, Hispanic businesses, uh, and, and LGBTQ businesses, all of us, realize that we're the majority of the taxpayers also. The, the facts are the facts. And so uh, business from Fortune 1000 firms, the US government, we need to deploy those resources back into the economy and make sure that there's equity in the marketplace. So besides capital and connections, we also need to make sure that, uh, you know, that we move forward uh, with, uh, of course, the tremendous uh, opportunity with capacity building. Many of these firms, we have small business programs and the capacity building is the third C, is how do we put them where they need to be? They don't want handouts. They just wanna be where the action's at. So for us at the US Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, our chairwoman, Alice Rodriguez with JP Morgan Chase, she is all about capital and small business. Uh, we're here to serve our, our 5 million plus Hispanic owned businesses. But at the end of the day, 61 million people in the US consider themselves Hispanic, uh, no matter what their, uh, or their race or what nationality they're, they're from, but 80% of the 61 million are people that are born and raised in this country and they should not be uh, relegated to invisibility any longer. This is our time. And so we're very excited about our powerful partnership with everyone on this panel and of course our elected officials. And we're honored to be a part of the Small Business Roundtable, John with you, of course, and, and the rest of the team. Well, Ramiro, you know that that's a treasured partnership on, on our end. Uh, capital, connections, capacity, three things that a successful business owner must navigate. Ramiro made some great points, but our, our next speaker, Megan. Megan, tell us a little bit about your story um, in, and where you've come from and what the business has been like and what the last year has been like. Sure, it's such an honor and a privilege to be here. I really appreciate uh, just the opportunity to speak. Um, so my business started in 2014. I was a stay-at-home mom of three, and I was just looking for a little project to keep me busy, <laughs> because that's the time you need to start a business when you have a three-month-old. <laughs> But uh, what I knew and what I had was wool. I grew up on a sheep farm and I had lots of wool and I had some time. So I would sit at the dining room table and I would take wool and rub it in my hands with warm soapy water. That's how felt is made. I would string them up in garlands and I, um, I put it up on Etsy, never thinking much would come of it. Just wanting kind of a little mental health uh, project for myself. Well, they did start selling and they sold and they sold until six months into the business, we ran out um, of our wool from our sheep farm. So we decided to partner with a fair trade group of artisans in Nepal to help us with our demand. And um, when the first box showed up, it had a thousand felt balls in it. And I almost cried because it was all of our, it was all of our, um, our profits were poured into that. And I thought, how am I ever going to sell this many felt balls? Well, they did. <laughs> we had to um, have an employee our first year. And we were at the point three years into it where we had felt balls 
everywhere in the house, closets, under beds, in our kids' closets, everywhere. And our hardest month is May. It's our lowest amount of sales are in that month. And also it's when Nepal, um, I need to get my orders in for fourth quarter because Nepal's rainy season is August through October. So if we're going to get a large amount of inventory ready for fourth quarter, it has to be, um, it has to be uh, purchased in May. So we were kind of at a crossroads where we were out of space and didn't have enough capital to pour into creating a new space, a new workspace for us, a new workshop, and also to get the inventory. So we reached out to some of our local banks and were denied loans because of the our taxes for the three previous years were not indicative of the growth we were, we were seeing, so we were denied that loan. However, we had partnered with Amazon. They had started Amazon Handmade, um, so we're one of their featured artisans, and we had Amazon Lending available to us, which um, we were pre-qualified for and it was just a couple clicks and we had capital available to us and we chose that route because it was very simple it was very fast um, we could spend you know that time pouring into our business instead of filling out paperwork so um, we had our cash flow we could uh, make a workspace and get the inventory that we needed um, for that fourth quarter. And that was our biggest fourth quarter up to that point where we had uh, you know, our first six figure fourth quarter. So that was just kind of the growth that we were able to have because of Amazon lending and partnering with them. Well, I, I there, there's a lot of incredible things to unpack there. The first is um, I've never known someone who's had to navigate the challenges of being a small business around the rainy season in Nepal. So <laughs> There is always a first for us here. Um, that story of sort of an alternative path to capital um, in order for you to grow, we, we have, it is a constant challenge and something we hear about tradition or businesses being denied traditional financing. And it sounds like you found success in this case with Amazon through one of their lending um, platforms. And, and, and I think that's incredible. Ramiro, I, is that something you have seen or are seeing? And Connie, I want to tag you in here too. Alternative access to capital. Is that something we need to be looking at? Is there more than just pushing banks to, to do more? Are there other players at the table as well? There are many players at the table now, uh, ironically, thanks to uh, the pandemic. Uh, prior to uh, COVID-19 uh, hitting this, this country, in the first quarter of last year, of the 10 Hispanic owned businesses that applied for lending or capital, even with the uh, instruments that we had available through the Small Business Administration, only two out of those 10 small business owners, business owners like Megan that applied, that happened to be Hispanic, received uh, approval on a loan. It, it, so the, the difficulty existed already with access to capital. And at the Small Business Administration, less than a thousand uh, lenders were SBA certified. Now that number is over 5,000 SBA certified. So credit unions are now at the table, micro, uh, enter, uh, micro lenders, uh, minority uh, development uh, institutions, uh, fintechs, uh, companies like PayPal and others who already know your, your customer base, they're providing uh, upfront capital or lending. And so big banks and community banks, now they're not the only player uh, because of COVID. And, and as for, of course, with the lending, with the Restaurant Revitalization Fund and the Paycheck Protection Program, what we need to tell people is to continue to scramble and to be hungry and to be creative and to ask for help for access to capital from all sources. In addition to family and other traditional forms of credit, everything now is creative and non-traditional, virtual, using technology and all types of platform platforms. That's the good news. What we need to say to you and everyone is because of this access to capital that is now opened up, we are able to add, if we are able to fill the credit voids in just the Hispanic small business community that traditionally had not been led to, uh, $1.5 trillion will be added to the US economy if we provide the capital gap and we fill that through non-traditional sources. So the pressure is up, which is good for all banks and community banks, 
but we need to have, uh, again, that sense of urgency because cash flow uh, reserves are at their lowest point ever. And so, yes, uh, uh, capital continues to be a big issue. Obviously, one of the three C's, John. But as uh, Megan mentioned, and I know Connie has mentioned, you know, a lot of uh, banks uh, and their loan committees traditionally did not do lending to minority-owned businesses or women-owned businesses uh, simply because of where their business were located or their credit score or their repayment history. In many instances, better than a non-minority uh, business, uh, and yet they were still being denied. So now, uh, really, the 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 covers off the ball. Uh, if we don't uh, provide capital uh, fluidly and in, in the amounts that they're needed to everyone, our economy will not recover and get back to where it was pre-pandemic. So it is a big challenge for us, but we're optimistic. Connie? John, if I could just jump in, uh, I agree with much of that Romero had to say, but it, we should be paying more attention to these alternative uh, institutions. Pre-COVID, we knew from Secretary Liu, former Secretary Jack Liu, that there were 8,000 declines for loans uh, every single day in this country by traditional banks. 8,000 declines per day. That is clearly a market failure. And so as we know that there are community lenders, community development um, lenders out there, also, these fintechs have emerged, not only from just creating a financial technology to get capital in the street, but as he said, just being able from the payments company and seeing what's going through the payments process and now being able to add loans quicker, that's great. And we need to see more of that. But my concern is how we might be leaving community-based lenders behind. When I listened to Megan tell her great story about how she went to Amazon a couple of clicks and she had it. You can't do that at a CDI for the most part now. Maybe a couple are beginning to gain that kind of capacity, but we need investment behind some of our community-based lenders so that they too in their own communities where many of the unrepresented and the underserved exist with their businesses, where they can actually get capital in the same way. They can come somewhere where they are trusted, where they trust, who will work with them side by side and be able to deliver the same speed, the same accuracy that Megan received from Amazon. If we all come together and put our focus on how do we bring FinTech and, and the community lenders together, to, to actually partner and bring some of this capacity and innovation up, I think that'll be a key piece. But that's still not far enough. We wanna make sure that the Amazons and all these other alternatives are also being transparent with the uh, business owners and entrepreneurs as they reach out to them. Making sure that there is accountability for having the right types of policies that will allow the greatest access. I'll give you one example that AEO is working on, and that's creating access to capital for entrepreneurs with prison records. What is reason? There's really no reason they should not be able to receive capital, but there are many, many, if not all, most companies automatically, like an Amazon or some other, that will just automatically decline an individual if they check off that they have a prison record. And so how do we now make sure and hold groups accountable for looking through their policies and finding where there are barriers for maybe not any real reason? When we started the conversation earlier on this panel, we were talking about how to bring more equity and how to bring um, a, a very big focus and prioritize these underserved, unrepresented communities. That is one way we began to do that. We get these institutions to start looking and examining their policies for capital, how and who gets declined and how we can begin to change that. AEO has become almost like a, a new knowledge center, particularly over the last four or five years, we have taken a deep dive in understanding black owned businesses. As the um, voice of micro business uh, in the nation, we actually work to service all businesses. 
But like I said, in the last four or five years, we took a deep dive in understanding Black-owned businesses. And we now have, through um, uh, our grantsmanship program, our grants program, where we've distributed over $300 million in grants to Black-owned small businesses, we've gained an awful lot of insights by being able to have over 60,000 data sets on Black-owned businesses. We know what these businesses look like inside and out. And we know that the capital products that are out here in many ways don't meet the needs of these businesses. So when we're talking about alternatives, we need to create even more alternative capital sources and do that intentionally with the insights we're learning about the needs of these businesses, how they operate, and how to get them right fit capital, not just any capital and say, okay, we have access, but making sure that intentionally we are designing capital products, investing in new underwriting. AEO, for example, has three new tests where we are looking at new underwriting models that could be adopted for not only women-owned businesses, one for women-owned businesses, one for startups, or what we're calling restarts, um, for, for the businesses who are having to come out of the pandemic with a new business model, a new underwriting tool for that. And then lastly, we're also looking at a new potential underwriting tool for um, entrepreneurs with prison records. We need to rethink how we think about risk. And if we don't do that, we're going to leave many businesses behind in this economy as we try to rebuild. Megan, I, I see a few questions coming through the chat. I, I wanna know how what Connie and what Ramir are saying is resonating with you as, as a business owner um, in, you know, obviously this worked out. Um, and I don't know if you wanna shed more light. I, we have a couple questions about, did you have to resort to sort of merchant cash advance or any aggressive kind of loans? It sounds like you didn't with what you went through with Amazon, but I think some folks would like to hear a little bit more about that. And then, you know, Connie and Ramiro talk about the need for a lot of solutions. Is, is that kind of your feeling as well, that there's, there's no wrong answer? We need more, not less? So uh, just a little bit more about what happened last year. I did take advantage of the PPP, which was absolutely wonderful. Um, and they had a lot of great points and great things to say. For me personally, um, it was a really hard year. In March of 2020, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. So on top of the pandemic and all of that going on, we had a personal crisis of just, I don't know what we were going to do because we had, um, this is our, main, our family's main source of income. Um, so we were at the point again, it was of course around March, April, May, our lowest, lowest sales of the year. Um, we couldn't pay for our um, employees, um, our medical bills. So it was just a real hard crisis. Um, so what we ended up doing, we did take advantage of the PPP to pay for um, about three months worth of payroll. Um, and then Amazon had reached out to us not knowing any of this. And they had started a campaign where they were highlighting different community, mem uh, different members of, of Amazon in different regions of the United States. And we were one of the first to be featured. Um, and it was hard because we had 20 cases of product ready to go to Amazon. There's two ways to sell through Amazon. One is FBA, Fulfillment by Amazon, where we take our product and we give it to them and that's the prime, free prime uh, shipping. And then the other way is Fulfillment by Merchant, where we take the product and then we ship it. We had 20 cases ready to go and then Amazon shut down and said we're only taking critical, critical things. Um, so we couldn't send our product in. We had no way to get our product out and then no, no employees to make our products. Uh, so they had done this feature for us. And that month in May, um, I told them, I'm really sorry, but I'm gonna be uh, going through treatment for breast cancer. Um, I can't be featured now. There's no way I can get product out. So my husband said, we, let's try selling these, you know, these ready to ship. As you can see, we have tons of, of SKUs. We have over a hundred SKUs, but we were only uh, able to list about 12 different products. And because of that feature, we had um, at the end of May sold 18 of those 20 cases. And what is usually a $10,000 month was a $50,000 month. And um, that is just the 
the power of Amazon. And also I will add one more C, which I feel has been the biggest point of success um, for my business this year, which has doubled, doubled our sales from um, in 2020 to from, from 2019. And that's community. Uh, when I was diagnosed, um, I leaned into my story and I had 18,000 followers on Instagram. And I, I said, I'm not wasting this opportunity. I know most of them are women. I, I need to, them to know about um, advocacy for breast cancer. And I brought them into my story. They saw me lose my hair. They saw all of it. And I think just having, having the realization, I didn't just have followers. I didn't just have customers. I had built a community. And that I think is the most, the hugest gift with small business, with handmade and being able to have a platform of social media. Like what a time to be alive where we can have access to so many customers anywhere in the world. And that was a huge success. The PPP, that feature and leaning on my community to really have the capital that we needed to keep going. I, I think it is incredible and community is not one. Sometimes I also hear, um about uh, confidence uh, coming from the community for folks to, to persevere. I think that's an incredible story. It's a 21st century story. Um, a lot of times, uh, Rhett, Ramiro, Connie, others have talked about the role of going digital uh, has played for so many people. And I, I honestly can't think of a better example than yours. And it's, it's an incredible story. You know, some of the questions are coming in about how an SBA program hasn't worked for them or has worked for them. One of them mentioned the uh, export import bank, um, Megan. I don't know if that's come across your your radar. Have Have you done anything with Exim by any chance? That's a bit of a tangent. I haven't. Honestly, we've been able to kind of stay afloat with our own our own profits and not needed to reach out for much capital. We're very fortunate. That's that is fantastic. And as you grow, you know, I I think it's one takeaway from all of these is there's so many government resources and. Mm. I, I think sometimes navigating that can be tough. I want to I want to close because a lot of these questions have have to do with what's next, what can be done. We have a lot of staffers from uh, Capitol Hill who've joined us today, and I know they'll be listening for ideas that they can take back to their offices. So, um, Connie and Ramiro and Megan too, uh, if if you have them, um, we've sometimes talked about the need for SBA to be modernized. We certainly know they need more resources. Um, Ramiro, or maybe Connie, start with you, and then Ramiro, and then we'll close with Megan. Um, quickly, any priorities about what needs to be done from a policy standpoint to support people like Megan? Yeah, AEO has always worked to address uh, the, like the micro loan program in SBA, and we still want to focus on things like SBA micro loan program and the community advantage program. But I think there are a number of things that could still be done going forward. One, I think we need to look across all of the funding programs and the capital programs, SBA, Treasury, USDA, and elsewhere. Look at all of those programs and look to make sure that they are screened against some type of equity and inclusion lens. We need to make sure that all of the programs across government really are developed and designed with the intention to actually get access to everyone. And again, I think you can only do that by understanding each of those big segments and trying to make sure the program can meet those needs of the different segments. Secondly, I think we, as we do that and look across these programs, Let's go to SBA just for example, since you mentioned them. Programs like 504 and, and other programs that typically may not fall to micro businesses. We need to think about what kind of opportunity those programs really can provide in real wealth building. You know, we focus so much on capital and debt, but you can't, you know, kind of debt your way uh, into, into really wealth building. And so when you have programs that go beyond working capital and allow business owners to invest in and buy real estate, to buy the buildings and the property that they're trying to operate in, you know, when you're allowing to do things like that, you really are helping businesses not only generate revenue, but you're helping businesses have a shot at real wealth building. We know, at least for Black-owned businesses, Business ownership is the fastest way to grow wealth for their families. 
And so as we think about how to modernize programs going forward, we want to think again, a little bit outside the box, not just how to get them digital access, not just how to make it speedier, not just looking at how do we um, change our view and lens about what risk is and what risk looks like, but we want to also go deeper across the programs and have a lens not only about equity and inclusion, but about asset and wealth building. I think if we take some of these principles and bring the insights to inform behind those principles, we can make real change in our capital access programs across the government. Ramiro? John, I agree with Connie. And, and of course, we're gonna hear uh, some more, uh, you know, strong uh, passion from Megan as an entrepreneur and the struggles that all of us go through. What we have found in during the pandemic is that we need to meet people where they are. Uh, whether it's in English and Spanish, many of our entrepreneurs who needed access to information, uh, they needed troubleshooting. So we, we became an organization that found its voice also, like many people did during the pandemic, tremendous acts of kindness uh, that, uh, you know, we've all read about or heard about we're really the standard. And if we can keep that spirit of uh, supporting one another and to meeting people where they are, giving them what they need, not waiting for our customer base to come to us or to just put technology uh, to use, but, but to troubleshoot. We're, we're all in the people business, no matter what we do. And what we learned is that people had questions about the PPP or now they had questions about the Restaurant Revitalization Fund. We need to work with people that have a passion for giving uh, citizens answers, uh, a bias to really uh, provide great customer service. Uh, that's one thing that I think we all saw an uptick during the pandemic that had gone away prior to the pandemic. If we can keep that spirit of breaking through bureaucracy uh, and at the same time making sure that we provide great customer service and answers to uh, each, each other, to, uh, to find solutions to our challenges, that would be uh, a tremendous outcome of all of this to give us the capacity, the capital, and the connections that we seek. The U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce is committed to doing all of these things in partnership with each of you. Thanks. Thanks, Ramiro and Connie. And, and the the feedback is feeding in just in alignment with how right you both are. Um, I, we are coming up on the hour and we have a few more remarks from members of Congress before my colleague Rep Buttle closes us out. So Megan, I just want to give you a, a few seconds for some, some closing thoughts, maybe a, a shot of optimism from an entrepreneur. And it's just been incredible to hear your story. Well, thank you so much. It has been wonderful hearing from the panel members of just different opportunities that I didn't even know were available. So I will definitely be sure to um, to look into those. And yeah, um, as far as optimism, uh, I just love seeing the communities being built. Um, I know we've all needed connection. Everybody needs less stuff and more community. And I think that's kind of what the pandemic has shown us that we need each other. We need small businesses, and it's wonderful to have um, the government working, you know, to help to help us. So I appreciate that. Well, everyone, please join me virtually in thanking Connie, Ramiro, and Megan. Um, it's been a stellar panel, um, and we will pivot now uh, to some remarks from members of Congress. Thanks, everyone. Hello, everyone, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to address the Small Business Roundtable today. As ranking member of the House Small Business Committee, House Financial Services Subcommittee on Consumer Protections of Financial Institutions, and as a small businessman with a background in both the banking and insurance industries, I understand the importance for small businesses everywhere to have access to capital. This past year, COVID-19 devastated small businesses with overreaching state and local shutdown measures and altered capacity restrictions. Through no fault of their own, small businesses faced extreme challenges. As a response, Congress created numerous small business relief programs including the Paycheck Protection Program. Since the beginning of the PPP over one year ago, the program has assisted millions of small businesses. Now, small businesses are regaining their footing. The PPP is winding down. As the PPP concludes, I will continue to focus on access to capital for all of our nation's small business owners. 
Having the funding available to hire, expand, and meet customer needs is vital for small businesses, entrepreneurs, and startups. Additionally, we must continue to conduct strong oversight on all of these programs as a way to protect and safeguard American tax dollars. Over the past few months, the SBA's Inspector General has released reports of waste, fraud, and abuse within the SBA's programs. With that being said, Congress must keep a close eye on the agencies charged with overseeing these programs. As small businesses continue to recover, we must ensure they return to operating independently. Prior to the pandemic, small businesses were reporting great optimism and confidence that resulted with fr from low taxes and a smart regulatory environment. <clears throat> it's important that we return to this environment and allow small businesses to grow, expand, and create jobs. Congress has a lot of work ahead of us when it comes to the small business economy, from ensuring the smallest firms can recover and grow independently, providing necessary agency oversight. I know we will be busy in the months and years ahead. I thank you for allowing me to share a few words. I look forward to working with, with all of you on these issues as Republican leader of the Small Business Committee. Thank you. Hi, I'm Angie Craig, and I'm proud to represent Minnesota's second congressional district in the U.S. House of Representatives. It's an honor to participate in today's discussion with the Small Business Roundtable to talk about my work on the House Small Business Committee to ensure that businesses in my district and across the country have the support they need to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and thrive in our communities. Throughout the pandemic, I've been so inspired by the grit, the determination, and the resilience of our small business community. Each step of the way, entrepreneurs have adapted, they've kept employees on the payroll, and continued to serve our communities. As restrictions wind down and we begin getting back to normal, we've got to ensure that the hardest hit small businesses have the support they need. From stimulating our economy with the American Rescue Plan to bold investments in our infrastructure. I look forward to working with the Biden administration to make sure that we set our small businesses up for success. I'm continuing to monitor the Shuttered Venues Operators Grant, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, the Paycheck Protection Program, and the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Programs to make sure that Congress allocates the necessary resources and that the Small Business Administration is responsive and executes these programs with acceptable customer service levels. Additionally, I recently passed legislation to improve the SBA's 504 loan program for small manufacturers. This bipartisan bill, which passed the House unanimously this spring, would increase the maximum loan amounts, streamline the process for loans, and provide additional support to manufacturers. I'm eager to get this passed in the Senate and to present it to President Biden and have him sign it into law. Thank you again to the Small Business Roundtable for inviting me to join today's webinar and for all that you do to help small business owners access the information and the support they need. Thank you so much for engaging in these important discussions and I look forward to continuing to work with small businesses across my congressional. Thank you. I just want to give a quick thank you to everyone who is able to join us today. Thank you so much to all of our amazing partner organizations. Thank you so much to the members of Congress who made time today uh, for this, what has been a critical discussion. Uh, I also want to thank, give thanks to our SBR team members, Chris Landrigan and Ashlyn Roberts, uh, who are behind the scenes pulling all of this amazing work together. Obviously, today would not be possible without them. For more information on Small Business Roundtable or any of our affiliate partners and the tools and resources uh, that we have available for you, please check out smallbusinessroundtable.org. With that, this is the end of our program. Thanks so much for joining everyone. Have a great week.